and I went around through the back, came back through the elevator, took him to bring, okay. you know, the same apartment. Yes. Okay. Come. And I said, this is your house. And I opened the door and I said, okay, ciao. And I just left him there alone. It was the same apartment. And he looked at it and said, oh, yes, this is my apartment. Things like that would happen. Right. And, and then maybe a few days after, he would start to say, I want to go to my house. David's house. This is not David's house. Amazingly, David sometimes referred to himself as the other David, as if his own self were an imposter. The Capgras delusion has been known since the turn of the century, but has been treated as a curiosity, an anomaly. The standard explanation which you find in most psychiatry textbooks is a Freudian one, and the idea is something like this. This young man, like most young people, when he was an infant growing up, he had strong sexual attraction to his mother, the so-called Freudian Oedipus complex. No, I, do, I, want, I, I don't remember what I said. But as he grows up, these Oedipal sexual urges towards his mother get repressed, but then along comes a blow to the head, and suddenly and inexplicably, these sexual urges come flaming to the surface, and he finds himself sexually attracted to his mother, and he says, my God, if this is my mother, how come I'm attracted to her? How come I'm aroused? This must be some other strange woman. And, uh, yeah, they spoke in Hebrew, right? He speaks Hebrew. Now, this is an ingenious explanation, but it doesn't quite work. Because I've seen a patient who has the same delusion about his pet dog. He'll look at his pet dog and say, Doctor, this is not Fifi. It looks just like Fifi, but in fact it's been replaced by another identical dog. So how does the Freudian explanation account for this? Unless you start talking about the inherent bestiality in all human beings or something like that. So what really causes the Capgras syndrome? Well, it turns out that when you look at an object, the message goes to the temporal lobe cortex where you recognize it. But seeing is a multi-level process. After you've recognized it, you also need to respond to the object emotionally. This is obvious when you look at a Picasso or a Rembrandt or any beautiful picture. Even when you look at, say, your mother's face, the appropriate emotional warmth has to be evoked. Or when you look at a lion, you have to be afraid. And all of this is part of the visual process, but happening in a different part of the brain. Whenever we look at an object or a face, the message reaches the temporal lobes where it's identified. But then it gets relayed to a structure called the amygdala, which is the gateway to the emotional centers of the brain. And it's here that we generate the appropriate emotional response to whatever it is we're looking at. Now, what I've suggested is the message gets to the temporal lobe cortex, so the patient recognizes his mother as being his mother and evokes the appropriate memories, but the message doesn't get to the amygdala because the fibers going from the temporal lobe cortex to the amygdala and to the emotional centers are cut as a result of the accident. Therefore, there is no emotion, there is no warmth. And he says, if this is really my mother, why is it I'm not experiencing any emotions? There's something not quite right here. Maybe see some other strange woman pretending to be my mother. That's the only explanation that makes sense to him given this very strange disconnection between the visual centers and the emotional centers in the brain. Ramachandran's hunch that David's delusions were being caused by the rupture of specific brain circuits was lent unexpected weight when David's mother recalled a strange incident with the phone. We got so tired of him saying, you're not my dad, you're my dad, you're not my mother, you're my mother. We decided, okay, you go downstairs, call on the phone and said, David, hi, and on the phone he would know he was his dad. On the phone he never ever had this problem. Had this problem. So on the phone he'd always recognize on the phone, the, as his father. As his father. No problem. When he saw him in person, he would in say, person, you look like my father, but, but you're, you're not, not really my father. My father. No. I'm waiting for my, he would come up and, no, I'm waiting for my father. This shows the patient is not crazy. Why would he be crazy in person, but not on the phone? The answer is, there's a separate pathway that goes from the auditory cortex, the hearing part of the temporal lobe, to the amygdala, 
and that pathway was not damaged to David by the car accident. Therefore, when he listens to his father on the phone, there is no delusion. Yeah, great. This is a lovely example okay. how you can take a completely bizarre neurological syndrome, maybe from the X-Files of neurology, which no one really understood, a person claiming that his mother is an imposter, and then come up with a very detailed explanation in terms of the known anatomy of the brain, saying, here is where the flaw is, and then doing an experiment that takes just an hour to do, and showing that this is what's gone wrong in this patient. Okay, are you comfortable? Mm -hmm. To test his theory about Capgras, Ramachandran arranges to measure David's galvanic skin response, which is the basis of the lie detector test. Whenever we look at something emotionally significant, the emotional centers of the brain prepare the body for action and we start sweating. This causes a big change in electrical resistance across the surface of the skin that can be measured. The prediction is that when people with normal brains look at photographs of people they do not know, they will not respond emotionally, so there will be no change in skin resistance but a familiar face will prompt an emotional response and invariably there is a change. Now the question is, what happens with David? If Ramachandran's theory is correct, pictures of his parents will not prompt an emotional response, so the line should remain flat. Now this is also telling you about how all of us, how normal people, respond to faces and to objects because what happens in this patient is truly extraordinary. The lack of emotional response actually leads him to this very profound delusion that this person is not really his mother. In other words, the lack of the autonomic gut reaction, this emotional response, leads him to an absurd conclusion overriding what his intellect is telling him. And this tells you how closely linked your intellectual view of the world is to your basic emotional reactions to the world. This lack of emotional response to familiar faces can feel extremely unpleasant. Oliver is another rare Capgra patient living in London. A few months ago he woke up convinced that the woman in bed beside him was his wife's double. And this double had evil designs on him. When I went out early in the morning, the sky was completely red. I thought it was like the end of the world. So I, I came back in and I got into bed and uh, my wife asked me what was wrong with me. And when I turned and looked at her, her eyes were red from no sleep like, you know. And I said, you're a vampire. She said, don't be mad, you know. Like, you feel like sometimes getting in there and giving them a good kick and say, wake up and, you know, whatever. Um, but it wasn't going to happen like that. I said, oh, you were one of them. She said, one of who? <laughs> Delusions as powerful as these suggest that in addition to damaged brain circuits, there may, after all, be a Freudian dimension to the Capgra delusion. This disconnection between the visual centers in the temporal lobes and the emotional centers in the brain cannot be a complete explanation for the full-fledged Capgra delusion. In other words, disconnection must, might be occurring but how you respond to the disconnection might depend on the particular relationship you had with that person prior to the damage to the brain. You know your wife, you're looking at her, talking to her every day, and this person just taking her place, you know? And she's not your wife, and she's, she's trying to convince you that she is your wife. Just because I go out in one set of clothes and come back and change into another, I'm not somebody else, or if I go out that door, I don't come in as somebody else. But to get him to believe that, I just couldn't. <laughs> 